In the past few weeks, following a number of high-profile appearances in alternative media, Andrew Yang seems to have made an impression with his proposal to give $1,000 a month to every American citizen. This replaces welfare, so if the person is currently receiving, let's say, $700 a month in welfare, then they'd only receive $300 a month in UBI. And this would be overlapping, so if someone's receiving, let's say, $700 in benefits right now, then you go to them and say, hey, you can keep your current benefits or you can go to the Freedom Dividend and get $1,000 a month free and So clear. they would have the option. They would have the option. He says that this is not socialism, but capitalism. In his own words, good for the economy, good for markets. He says it would actually grow the economy between 12.57% and 13.1%. One major driver for this policy is his view that automation will cause massive job losses. His official campaign literature predicts that one third of Americans will lose their jobs by the year 2030. Oh boy, where does one start with this one? First, let's start with this idea that automation creates overall job losses. It's just not true, is it? Let's take the UK, a country which is indisputably more post-industrial and service-based than the US. This is the total number of people employed in the UK from 1856 to today. In this 150 year plus stretch of time, we saw the rise and then complete collapse of UK manufacturing, including the entire coal industry and the steel industry and the enormous mills and textiles factories that made this country an economic powerhouse in the 19th century. And yet, more people have jobs today in this country than they did in 1976 or indeed 1886. And despite Yang's claims, exactly the same is true in the United States. Ah, but you might say, agent, back in the day, these people were doing good, fulfilling, manufacturing work, whereas now they're mostly in rubbish jobs. So let's take a look at real per capita median income, shall we? And you can see that uh, today in the UK it's gone up and also in the US you can see the same trend. That means that the person right in the middle of the income distribution today gets paid more than the equivalent person in 1976. So the basic claim being made by Andrew Yang is just incorrect on a factual level. The productivity gains made by automation create new opportunities to make money elsewhere. This current scare is no different to someone worrying about uh, what all the out of work typists were gonna do once computers replace them or somebody worrying about the horse and carriage industry, which employed, remember, hundreds and thousands of people for centuries. You know, those people's jobs were suddenly completely outmoded when Henry Ford popularized the automobile. Whatever were they all going to do? And it seems that no matter how many times this argument has been made and explained by economists, literally from the 1880s to now, people are still convinced that the next big automation will somehow be different. Their feelings don't care about your facts. They can see the typists and the horse and the carriage. They cannot see the jobs that are yet to be created. Anyway, uh, with that aside, what about this proposal from Yang itself? Let's take Yang at his own words that this will grow the economy. Presumably he thinks that he'll do this by increasing demand for consumer goods. Let's pretend we have five basic groups of people in the economy. The very rich people who have, let's say, 10K a month to spend. Uh, the reasonably well-off people who have 5K a month to spend. Uh, those in the middle with 2K a month to spend and those who are struggling to get by with about $500 to spend, and then people who literally earn nothing. 
We also have a bunch of goods at different price points. Uh, our 10 grand uh, guy, his monthly spend might look something like this. He buys a car, some clothes, 100 meals, uh, and a TV, and then puts 5K into savings and investments. $500 guy, he might look more like this. He can't afford the TV or the car, uh, and he also has to buy fewer meals, but he puts about $140 in the bank. Our zero dollar guy looks like this. He buys nothing and saves nothing. So Yang's idea is that by giving everyone $1,000 extra a month, we're gonna boost market demand. $500 guy, if he keeps his current consumption exactly the same as it was before, could now afford a car after three months rather than waiting for a whole year to save up for it. And $0 guy can now actually afford stuff so he starts to buy meals and clothes and whatever else. And in six months or so, if he saves wisely, he might be able to get the car. So everyone's a winner, no? Well, maybe, but that's assuming that our retailers don't respond to the massively increased demand by raising their prices. In fact, under Yang's specific proposals, this would definitely happen because he wants to fund UBI using value-added tax. The way we pay for it is we implement a value-added tax, which right now is in practice in every other industrialized country in the world except for us. Uh, and through a value-added tax then, so Amazon, now it's 43% of e-commerce, like largest market cap. Jeff Bezos could be the first trillionaire. Um, but there are periods when they said, hey, we didn't even make any money like th this quarter. Um, so, you know, no income tax. Mm -hmm. um, whereas a value-added tax, then they, they pay um, based on transaction, and that's inescapable. That's one reason why uh, other countries use it, is that it's a much, much more effective way to get revenue. And so if you're a self-driving truck company, you might not have many humans making money, and so there's not much income tax coming, coming but a value-added tax, then we get our fair share. And uh, a value-added tax would generate between seven and $800 billion if we were to implement it at half the European level. That means that consumer prices would certainly increase under Yang's proposals. So in effect, what has happened here? Well, our $0 guy can now afford some clothes, but our $2,000 guy can now afford slightly fewer clothes than he did before. Our guy in the middle, in real terms, is worse off. Now let's think about the incentives of this guy. This is the $500 guy. He currently does some menial labor for $500 a month, and work is typically something people do for necessity, not because they particularly like it. Humans generally prefer leisure to labor. So here he is after UBI. Now weigh up the benefits and costs. Do you want this or do you want this? Let's have a look at that choice again. This or this. For many people, the benefit of increased leisure time will outweigh the hassle of going to work. And what are the knock-on effects of that? Well, the owner of $500 guy's firm, who is likely a $10,000 guy, now has a problem. All of his workers who were on $500 have left to go home to play video games. So he has no choice but to advertise the job at a higher price. But even if he doubles the price, let's say charges $1,000 a month, he still doesn't really attract anyone. People still would rather uh, do nothing than to get up for that sort of money. The opportunity cost for individuals of not spending eight hours a day on dead or alive six is too great for most of them at this rate. And so our $10,000 guy ends up attracting nobody to work for him and ends up having to shut down uh, the business. Now remember that our $2,000 guy's life is materially worse off. He gets less for his money than he could before. But his incentives are such that he still has to work. And he sees a lot of guys enjoying this when his life is this. So overall, he's gonna feel less happy. So just to review, the number of people in the economy at the $500 a month level is going to reduce massively 
possibly even to zero, that will reduce the number of $10,000 guys and massively increase the number of $0 guys. We've ended up making the $2,000 guys less happy overall. But now consider that many of those $500 guys are likely working in the production and distribution of the very consumer goods on which people are spending their money. And the same effects apply up and down the chain. So it's perfectly possible we end up with fewer consumer goods overall because now they can no longer be produced at a price that will return a profit. These are just some of the likely effects of this policy. I've not even started to consider how it might affect, for example, housing costs. That is the cost of rent and indeed uh, house prices. And it should be obvious at this point that Andrew Yang has not even started to think about the long run effects of this policy because he's ignored entirely the lessons of basic economics. Therefore, it is destined to fail. That doesn't mean, of course, that it won't attract votes. Uh, I mean, yay, money for nothing, right? It's money for nothing. Of course, yeah, I'll vote for that. You know, give me, uh, give me, give me the Xbox. Give me, the, give me that lifestyle. I have to, I have to do nothing. Yay, Andrew Yang. But the idea it will leave us better off rather than worse off in the long run is a fantasy. Now get out. And a very special thanks to Stetson F. Lionel, the ambivalent onion. Christopher Scholholm, The Crimson Satyr, Chris, Kieran Hayward, Mr. A.M. Swainson, Radical Liberation, The Binary Surfer, Tragic Vision, Bailey and Aurora, Toyotomi Ami, Holy Spatula, Alexander, Froggy, Splice, Buck Hegit Society, Michael Meir, J. Green River, Michael Tynan, Heronius Napalm V, Vincenzo Rapio, and Edward Dara.